Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Chats in the Blog Cabin. You know, the show where I invite people into the blog cabin and we're going to chat about life. Today, we're chatting about a very deep subject, depression. Now, and I want to erase the stigma that surrounds depression. So I have Sarah here and she wrote the book, Fighting Chance, How Unexpected Observations and Unintended Outcomes Shape the Science and Treatment of Depression. Now, our full disclosure, I talked to Sarah before this, before we came on and told her that I had only gotten a fourth of the way through the book because it's such dense material. But Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself and your reason for writing the book first. Okay. Um, so my name is Sarah. I, uh, I am in my second career as a science writer. My first career, I was in the Air Force for a little over 31 years. Um, I'm retired in 2018 as a major general. I was in computers and cybersecurity in, in, that, um, in the Air Force. Uh, so when I retired, I had a chance, I had some free time and a chance to dig into my, um, my deep interests. And one of them was uh, depression. And the reason is, so I've, I've had a friend, we've been friends since our lieutenant days. Uh, we were both young people in the Air Force together. Her name's Carolyn. And uh, she and I were stationed together a um, long, long time ago. And about, and if you knew Carolyn, so she is this happy, outgoing, really gregarious person. But about, um, it seems, I guess, about uh, 13 or 14 years ago now, um, she got depression. And she went from being that happy person into someone who is just sad and timid and, worst of all, um, suicidal. So I found out about what she was going through um, after she got out of the hospital, you know, following a suicidal ideation. And from there, there were suicide attempts. It was just, it was this incredible change in, in this person who I was close to. And um, so we were, we were friends. And of course, I wanted to, to help her or not to hurt her. But it went through, we went through about, I think she went through about seven or eight years of just what seemed like this constant depression and nothing seemed to help. Um, finally, she did get some, uh, some therapy that helped her and she kind of, she came out of the depression uh, in a way, but she was always, she was just not herself anymore. She was just, again, quiet and timid. So when I retired uh, from the Air Force and I had a chance to dig into my interests, I wanted to understand depression. I wanted to understand. I wanted to understand what she was going through. I wanted to. I wanted to help her, of course. Um, but I was also afraid when I interacted with her. I was always afraid that I would. I would say or do the wrong thing, and she would, you know, literally kill herself. Or I would fail to do or say the right thing, and you know, again, um, she would just cause herself harm. So there was always this this tension of gosh, do I dare talk to her? Do I dare not talk to her? Um, do I dare get together with her or not get together? You know, it just, it was, it was um, just really challenging to being on the outside and seeing someone that you care about, you know, going through something like that and not being able to help. So if you, if you Google depression, you will find just an incredible amount of information. Um, some of it true, some of it false, some of it contradictory, some of it, you know, just way out there. And what, when I did that, when I just started looking up, okay, what's depression? What can I do? Um, I did not find anything useful. I think it, it made me even more confused. So I started digging into it. I started, I learned the science. Um, I picked up a couple of massive textbooks on neuroscience and on cellular biology, um, studied them. And then I went into uh, the like scholarly journals and I started talking to academics and researchers and people with depression or who had recovered from depression and just to understand it and put it together into a, a book, like you say, a, a very densely packed, <laughs> fact filled, I don't mm -hmm. not quite fun filled, but I do hope that as you get through it, you'll see that there's a lot of hopefulness in there. Um, there's, I talked to a lot of people who have gotten through depression and are on the other side and who are very positive about the possibilities of someone getting better. So that's why I put it into the book. I, I learned a lot um, and I wanted to put that information out where, where other people could learn. 
So let's talk about your research behind the book because there's a lot of research and just the, let's not talk about the actual patients that you research, but the, right. the, the doctors and the therapies and everything else that you've researched throughout the book. I mean, I was totally shocked to find out the electro, um, the ECTs. Electroconvulsive that, therapy. Yeah. They use that for um, de treating depression. I never even thought that they did that. Yes. So that that's fascinating because you think about it. So electroconvulsive therapy, they're running the electric current through someone's brain until they go into a convulsion. And, you know, you think about that, like, why, why did they even try that? I mean, why would you think, oh, here's a depressed person. Maybe if I run electricity through their brain, they'll get better. So that was one of the really interesting uh, stories, actually, that um, it actually started out as convulsive therapy. The electricity just came later. And what they there was this doctor back in like 1910s 1920s and he was in a psychiatric hospital and of course they had so many patients there because there was just no treatment for people with mental um, illnesses so they'd be stuffed in a hospital and then you know kind of left um so this doctor he noticed that the people with um epilepsy rarely had schizophrenia and the people with schizophrenia rarely had epilepsy and then when he looked post-mortem at some brains, he saw the people with epilepsy had an overgrowth of a certain type of brain cell and people with schizophrenia had less than the normal amount of that certain type of brain cell. So he thought maybe I can cure schizophrenia by giving somebody uh, basically a grand mal seizure. I, I like it, it's like they're, they have epilepsy. I'm gonna you know, give them this huge seizure. So he was able to, to um, experiment with some patients. They were, I mean, again, 1910s, 1920s, and. Uh, I guess you could just experiment with your patients if you want to. Um, and some of them were like catatonic. They hadn't been awake for years. You know, they're in a vegetable state. And what he did was he uh, was able to uh, start a convulsion using a chemical. He'd inject a chemical, I think it was camphor, into their hindquarters. And after a while, they'd, have, they'd go into a convulsion. And actually, so the people with schizophrenia, um, they I guess they weren't very much helped by it, but there was... Uh, several people with um, with depression who actually recovered. Uh, they came from this complete, you know, non-functional state into, and after about like 10 or 12 um, treatments, they were able to, they were back, they were able to, to function. So that's how convulsive therapy got started. And then in like the 1930s, 1940s, um, they found that electricity was just a better, easier way to give somebody a seizure. So yeah, so it actually has a logic behind it. It's actually used a lot because it is one of the most effective um, treatments there is. About 70% of the people who go undergo ECT um, go into remission from it mm -hmm. um, compared to pe with people with a uh, traditional antidepressants, the you know medications like mm -hmm. uh, Zoloft or whatever, uh, about 50% of the people with depression get to remission just from antidepressant medications. So I can see why certainly doctors start with antidepressant medications. They're a lot easier to do and a lot you know, easier on people. Um, but for some people who don't respond to them and are just, just miserable, just unable to you know, live a normal life, a lot of them do move on to ECT. <laughs> so let's talk about the research with the, the medical professionals and the professors that did all this research. How long did it take yeah. you to compile all this research? in the book. Like I said, I'm a quarter way through it and there's a ton of research yes. already in the book. I went through a couple of phases. So like I said, reading just textbooks for background information, I actually did that before I retired. I knew that I was going to retire soon and what I wanted to work on. So that I caught that out of the way. So as soon as I retired, I spent, gosh, it was about a year just doing online research, um, places, you know, reading all these scholarly journals, these, these, um, these papers to find out what, you know, what is depression? Where does it come from? How do you treat it? You know, do these treatments work? So that was basically online research for about a year. And then I lined up the people that the names of the people that I'd really like to talk to, you know, who are the experts um, in, in this field? Who are the leaders? And, you know, <laughs> make some, send some emails, make some calls, try to get some interviews. So that was about the scattered over a second year. And with that time, I was also talking to people who uh, suffered from depression. So it was like a year of book research and then a year of talking to 
to people, to the academics, to doctors, and to people with depression, and putting it all together. About a two-year process to get to a first draft. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Because I will tell you that the amount of research, I mean, honestly, I was like, wow, this is really interesting because like I said about the uh, ECTs, not knowing that people do that. And the, I know. Normal, <laughs> the normal pe the normal pe time that most people have is what, 15? And that one particular patient that you talked to had it 50 times. I was like, wow, oh. I can't even imagine. <laughs> when you get towards the end of the book, you're going to see somebody with 146 and counting. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oof. So let's yeah. talk about mental <laughs> illness because obviously you're from the military. They don't really, they kind of hush hush some of it. Like if you have to go get help, they yes. slip under the rug. So let's talk about the stigma around mental illness. Yeah, that is, that is so sad because there are so many people who can be helped um, who are afraid to seek help, whether they, you know, fear an impact on their jobs, on their relationships, or they just think that they're weak. So one of the, you know, depression is so insidious. It's it's like having depression means that you're going to have you're just going to have extra trouble getting help for yourself because you feel guilty, you feel worthless, you feel like oh, you know, I'm not worth uh, you know, wh why should I get help? Um there's other people suffering in the world, you know, I just don't deserve it. That's and that's part of the illness, of course, feeling like that. So there's this terrible stigma um, around mental illness. But what I found, what, what really fascinated me was, and I think one of the, the biggest surprises for me in researching the book was how physical depression and presumably other mental illnesses really are. Like with depression, they see physical changes going on in the brain that either cause depression or accompany depression. You know, it's, it's, it's a physical change in the brain. And then when they give people antidepressants, depressants, they can see those changes, you know, reversing themselves. And it's more than, you know, so there's physical changes going on in the brain and they have physical causes. They're not because somebody is worthless or, you know, or weak or weak willed or whatever, you know, people tell themselves it's because there are, there are actual physical ca um, causes. Um, and uh, it also, it strikes people in a physical manner. So of course we're all used to depression, meaning, okay, somebody's sad. Um, they just, you know, they are grieving all the time. They, they don't, they don't want to do anything. They, they distance themselves, but there's also a whole lot of other symptoms that usually go with depression. And it's kind of a grab bag. Sometimes they show up some in various forms. Sometimes they don't like people have usually have trouble sleeping. Either they sleep too much or they can't sleep enough. Um, same thing with eating, either they eat too much or they just have no appetite and can't eat. Um, my friend, Carolyn, she had kind of a, she would, her speech patterns were different. So I think it was a, what they call psychomotor retardations where you just, you're just living just a slower life, slower world, or, you know, psychomotor agitation, you're just agitated and just like you feel, uh, I don't know, activated all the time. Like you're on adrenaline all the time. Mm -hmm. So there's all these physical symptoms that go with it. And it really is physical changes. So I think people focus on mental and not illness. <laughs> and it really is an illness that people get from real causes. So I hope that getting people out there and, and as people talk about their depression and what they've been through, I'm hoping it helps people realize that this is, this is no, well, of course it's a little bit different, but it's, it's kind of like you broke your arm you need to go and get help to get your arm mended. It's not like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm weak and that's why my arm broke. That is, that's just not right. That is so true. So how did you come across all the um, case studies, all the people that you included in your book? Yes, so that was kind of challenging. Um, I went to, so there's some organizations, some helpful organizations like the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, and they have a chapter in just about every city. Um, so I went to some of the NAMI family support groups and I told them that, hey, I'm doing this book and I really want to talk to people um, who have depression. So I handed out a flyer, um, said, you know, here's how you can contact me if you, you know, if your loved one wants to talk to me. Um, that got me a few interviews. And sometimes when, you know, I, I didn't actually bite them, you know, it was, the interviews went fine. Um, they would refer, you know, friends or other family to me. So it just kind of kind of grew. So in addition to my friend, Carolyn, uh, you'll see interviews there with uh, 15 other people 
who um, suffer from depression or there's like one or two who's um, who had like a, a loved one who suffers from depression. Yeah, we're, let's talk about depression emotions because they go anywhere yeah. like you say in your book. Anger, sadness, irritation, guilt, affecting not only your sleep and your ap appetite, but even how someone processes their perceptions of the world. Let's talk about yes. that. Yeah. Yeah, that's where psychology seems to really um, have be centered. It's people with depression, they see everything and they process information through a negative lens. And they've done actual tests on these um, to see what's what people are doing. So it's like read somebody a list of words and some of them are, you know, happy words. Some of them are sad words and some are just neutral words. And then a minute later, ask them, how, which words do you remember? Somebody with depression remembers the negative words. They don't remember the happy ones. You show them, you know, pictures and um, uh, people with different expressions and they'll, they will focus their eyes on the people with unhappy expressions rather than happy expressions. It's just their information. It's not even conscious uh, that they're, they're not even conscious that they're doing it, but that's how their brains are perceiving information. It's like only, only the bad and the negative is allowed in. So it's, I think it's still a mystery why it's like that. Um, one of the things, again, you know, I say depression is, it's very physical. Um, one of the things they found is that the right side of the brain, you know, there's a difference between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere of the brain. Um, we are used to, we're kind of used to that because, you know, people who are left-handed use their right brains and more, and they, we say, you know, they're creative. Um, and people who are right-handed use their left side of the brain. And we t have them as more, you know, more logical and organized. And, you know, it's, to some extent, it's true. To some extent, it's probably just, you know, an old wives tale. But um, but there are differences between the left and the right sides of the brain. And the right side also, it may hold creativity, but it also holds, to me, it's like Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. That's where, you know, anger and irritability and guilt and feeling of, you know, diseased, um, death, all that negative stuff is on the right side of the brain. And when the right side, and in, in depression, the right side tends to be hyperactive and the left side tends to be underactive, you know, hypoactive. So it really, like I said, it's really very physical, but it shows up in the whole world that surrounds a person with depression. They'll see negativity, they'll feel it um, everywhere. Wow. I mean, honestly. <laughs> is that I mean, dense or what? <laughs> that is super dense. What did you... Before we came on, you talk, I thought it was really funny, wasn't it? Now, depression is not a joking matter, but I thought it was funny the I way know. you referred to your book. Yeah. Yes. Well, so when a editor and a reviewer both referred to the book as dense, I realized that. So my book is what I consider the cheesecake of depression literature. So it's very... Um, it's like I said, very dense. Um, don't try to eat it all in one meal. <laughs> it's going to take several, you know, several sessions to actually read through the whole thing. <laughs> and with that said, we're going to go to a commercial. But Sarah, do you have a part of your book picked out to read? Yes, I do. OK, so we're going to come back and she's going to read part of that cheesecake on depression. Yes. <laughs> so here we go, guys. Hey guys. Hey guys, welcome to the blog cabin. I'm Melissa Vera and I actually blog at Adventures of Frugal Mom and I blog at Champagne Style Bear Budget and Reading with Frugal Mom. I started blogging in 2011, but I didn't really start getting serious in 20, until 2014. And when I started getting serious in 2014, I really decided that I needed to start making it a full-time job and make some money off of blogging and I turned it into that. I'm coming to you from the blog cabin which is a she shed that I bought with all of my proceeds from blogging. I'm still, don't worry, I'm still making money blogging but this is coming from um, the proceeds that I made blogging. Everything inside it was also purchased from money that I made blogging and so I wanted to come to you to tell you about a course that I created called How to Make Money Blogging. Imagine that. And in this, a lot of bloggers get stuck on, okay, I just need to make money on sponsored posts. There's so many different ways that you can make money blogging. And in this course, we go over how you can make money. We talk about affiliate links. We talk about how you can help other bloggers. We're talking about photography. Everything you could possibly think of and more in this blogging course. Now, I do teach this course once a month 
with Joyworthy. Um, you go to youarejoyworthy.com to check it out. They have their event brightly. But I also teach it on a one-to-one -one basis, which you get a little bit more um, in depth. And it's an interactive course, so you're able to ask questions throughout the time. And I also teach it into a more in-depth course, which is a five-week course. If you're interested in any one of these courses, please let me know. Email adventuresfrugalmom at gmail.com, and I'll get right back to you. Happy money making. And we are back. Sarah, are you ready to read from your book, Fighting Chance? I am going to read from my book, Fighting Chance. Um, I'm reading the section where it actually, uh, it's, it's an part of an interview with someone whose child has depression. And it really echoes to me because this person is, a, is an outsider also, and he's looking in and trying to help somebody. And this is what he's seen. The note was brief, but shattering. I'm sorry, dad, I'm having trouble. And I'm not sure if I want to leave, live anymore. Steve thought his heart might stop. He looked up at his son, 15 year old Danny and patted the seat next to him. Danny sat down. Dad, he started, I'm in this bad spot. I feel really horrible. I'm hurting myself and I'm worried about what I might do. He was cutting himself, self mutilating. He had confided in a friend who was so worried he gave Danny an ultimatum, tell your dad or I will. The note had been the easiest way for Danny to start the difficult conversation. As Steve would tell me many years later, he was stunned. He hadn't known his son was struggling and he didn't know anything about depression, but he did know what he was hearing required immediate action. He took Danny to the hospital that night where he was admitted for 72 hours observation. All they did was follow him around, Steve said. They put him into a treatment center. So from the emergency room, we went to a kind of a section eight place in the hospital and moved him over to an actual institute or something. And so he spent three days there. They gave him some meds, calmed him down, talked to him and released him. It was the first of four hospitalizations for Danny who was eventually diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder. It has been a long education for Steve and Danny on mood disorders. Everything else aside, Steve said, from what I've viewed over the last 10 years is that it seems to be a disease, a cycle, like a sine wave, it comes and goes. It gets horrible and it gets better and does it again and again. And the frequency, I haven't determined exactly, but I think that's what's underlying this. He has good times and bad times and sometimes they stretch out and other times he'll have a very depressive streak for a while without much let up. And those are tough. That's when he gets hospitalized. He has a very crisp and clear headed suicidal ideation and he's aware of it. It comes and it goes. When it comes and it's persistent, there's some other symptoms. They tried many treatments in the early years of Danny's illness. So we went through the hundred drugs, Steve said. You know, you go through and you try this. From the beginning, he was hospitalized and he's been under psychiatric care and he's been in counseling ever since then. Notwithstanding a short period of time when he stopped taking his meds, which was obviously a disaster, he's taken lots and lots of meds. Nothing really worked for long. And if you have anything to do with these situations, they're absolutely throwing darts. The doctors try this, they try that. You ramp on and you ramp off. You can't get, you can't mix this. You can't mix that. That was the first couple, three years trying to get the meds right. I think sometimes that the meds get changed arbitrarily because you think that they're not working. But I have a really strong suspicion that there's a disease coming through here and it upsets everything else. When you see the disease, then all the things you're doing to treat it, maybe successfully, maybe not, get changed. A lot of times they'll change the meds when somebody's struggling, but I think they struggle despite everything else. I think the disease comes through at some frequency and if you don't panic, well, either you'll make it through or you won't. We tended to go through a lot of change periods when he would have racing thoughts or he would struggle quite a bit. Anyway, the reason I wanted to read that is because that is the sort of situation that, like I said, that I thought I was in. I'm on the outside and I'm really frustrated because I see all these things happening and I see these, you know, tr my friend taking these treatments and they don't seem to work. And you just want to know what on earth is going on? Why, you know, why can't we, yeah, you know, there's so many medications. Why can't we actually, you know, you get the right one and fix this? Yeah, that is so true. I, I think a lot of people don't understand until they're actually in where they're watching someone they love go through this. I mean, mm -hmm. I actually did a panel back in the fall on mental health on the suggestion of my middle daughter, who was, she came out and said that she was diagnosed as bipolar during that particular episode. And she had the suicidal yeah. ideologies as well. And yeah. it was eye opening to listen to her tell her story because you have to let them tell their stories their way and not try to interrupt and just let them be, you know, to express how they feel. Yes. Yeah, it's it's incredible. So um, with depression and with bipolar um, disorder, they're actually 
there's so much more of it out there than we realize. Um, it's so well hidden because people, you know, they, they get dressed, they go to work. You know, it's not like we have luxury of not living our lives. It's just people are living it with misery. And often they're hiding away um, the fact that, that they have this illness. Um, with depression, the prevalence in the United States, it's like 15% of lifetime, uh, mm -hmm. lifetime prevalence of depression. That means about one in every seven um, people in the US will be in a major depressive episode at least once during their lifetime. And that's, that's a lot, wow. that's a huge number. Bipolar disorder is not quite as prevalent. Um, I, I think it's about uh, 2%, two to 3%, but you know, they also, they, they don't know for sure. So it's out there, it's prevalent, and people are, I think in many cases, afraid to get help or just the progress of the, of the illness for themselves. They think they're not worth it or they think they're, you know, they can't be helped. I know there's a lot of um, different um, people that you have in your book, like one particular one that really stood out in my mind was the one being, she was non-functional and she was a parent. So she had to explain to yeah. her, was it three-year-old little boy, how, you know, why mommy was sad, why mommy was this, why mommy yeah. couldn't work. And that's, that's so hard. So talk about being on the outside looking in at, and living day to day with someone who has depression. Yes, which is that's something I have not been through um, because my depressed friend was, you know, a friend and um, I so I wasn't living with it. Um, but you there's a couple of the people that uh, I interviewed um, who are in the book and they are they are caregivers. So the mother of somebody with a depression and the husband of a wife with schizophrenia um, and they eventually got depression themselves um, because you know they were just so worn down. One of the one of the most potent factors that uh, people that seems to result in depression is chronic stress. So especially when you're a caregiver, when you're always tired, when you you know you kind of you're you're trapped your whole you're kind of trapped <laughs> into mm -hmm. a um, situation that you can't get out and do things and um, you know live live your life. That's a, a very long-term, that's a very stressful situation in the long-term and that a lot of people from caregiver stress end up with depression. So yeah, and people who are living with somebody who's depressed, they they need to look after themselves. They they really do. And they need to encourage the, the person, you know, to, to get help. They need to understand that, especially nowadays in the last, like, I don't know, maybe about 10 years, the treatments uh, that have become available are just really incredible. There's so many new and much more effective things, like a couple of them, ketamine, uh, low-dose ketamine. You're, you might be used to ketamine, a special K, a street drug. Um, it's usually an anesthesia, but under very low dose, it's a rapidly acting antidepressant that uh, is effective for about 60% of the people who were treatment resistant. So. They, they're the ones who didn't respond to an antidepressant medication, but about 60% of those do just improve really rapidly under ketamine. Another one is transcranial magnetic stimulation, where you remember I mentioned the right side is hyperactive and the left side is hypoactive. They use magnetism to kind of affect how active the neurons are so they can calm the right side or bolster the left side and you know get people back to a, a, a reasonable balance. So it's just incredible um, what's out there now and what, uh, what the doctors can actually do. Now we also, you also cover in the book, the guilt that family members feel because they're yeah. like, well, depression. So let's talk yeah. about that. Yes. So I, I suppose it, I suppose in a way it's like my feelings that I was going to do or say something and Carolyn would be made worse, you know, possibly even to the point of suicide. Um, or I was going to not do or say, you know, I should be, taking care of her and, and making her feel better and, you know, just something. And so seeing that, that I guess I felt guilty and I felt, you know, helpless and frustrated that I couldn't seem to help her and fearful that I was actually going, that I was hurting her. Um, and that's something that, so people, you know, weird as it is, and I've talked to Carolyn quite a bit, she's still, she's still, She's doing great right now. She's thriving. Uh, the ketamine actually really uh, worked well for her. Um, but she said, you know, it. I was so, me, I uh, was really pretty much irrelevant to her experience mm -hmm. of depression. You know, I hate to say that, but it was, it was coming from 
within her, um, there was nothing I could do or say that would either make her suicidal or, you know, make her not suicidal when she was, you know, getting uh, ready to, you know, attempt suicide. Um, I was, it's amazing, but it really is a bot. It's a product of some physiological actions that are going inside a person's brain. Um, they can be affected with, uh, you know, antidepressant medication, the psychotherapy with these other new modern treatments. So it's really important that you get somebody to go get help, but someone, you can't feel guilty that that's, you gave somebody depression. Nobody gives, you know, you don't give somebody depression or suicidality. You, it's coming from within them. Yeah, that's so true. So what exactly, a lot of people don't have an idea of what depression is. And then Teresa's story kind of shattered what you thought about what depression was. So yes, in layman's terms, what <laughs> okay. is depression? Because I think a lot of people think, oh, I'm feeling sad. Oh, I'm sad because the my favorite TV show went off. Oh, I'm so depressed, you know, because they throw around that word so easily, but that doesn't yes. necessarily mean that they're depressed. So doctors have not been able to find like a blood test that would say, okay, this person has depression. So even though they know there's physical changes going on, it's not easily accessible. So the way the doctors define, uh, well, diagnose depression is they say that, okay, first of all, if we're looking for something that's going on for at least two weeks, so not a bad day, not even a bad week, but at least two weeks, and during those those two weeks, um, either all the time or almost all the time, the person has been either had depressed moods. They're either really sad or they've just completely lost interest in things. So one of those um, mood effects. But then they look for the other. You know, you remember I mentioned um, not sleep. You know, sleep disruptions or eating disruptions or you know can't think or think about suicide or think about death all the time. They're looking for, I think it was four other of those symptoms again over the two week period. So because depression is so individual and um, the fact that there's no easy test for it, they have to rely on that. Okay, two weeks of things are, you know, this horrible, sad mood, plus these other, these physiological disturbances. That's where they, that's really where they, they see as, uh, you know, defining that somebody is depressed. Wow. I mean, honestly, there's another, another question that actually came up as, as I was reading it. Um, and it, you actually brought up about Dinah and her story. Yeah. It's yeah. like, do children of people with depression, do they, how are they affected and do they pass it down to their children? Is this something in their genetics that makes them depressed? So it seems that vulnerability to depression, um, there's a couple of factors that makes, so everyone's vulnerable to depression. Everybody is. Some people are more vulnerable and some people are less vulnerable. Um, the more vulnerable people, the things that people that make people more vulnerable, there is a genetic component and also early life adversity. So the people who, you know, as children, they they lost a parent, um, they went, they underwent um, you know, sexual abuse or emotional abuse is a really powerful one. Um, they had these childhood, this childhood adversity. Those are the people who are more vulnerable to depression. But in straight numbers, when they look at genetics, um, if so, like I said, about 15%, one, you know, one five, 15% of Americans, of people in the US. Uh, will have depression sometime in their lifetime. If you have a first degree relative, so like a parent or um, you know a, a sibling with depression, then about 22% of those people have depression at least once in their lifetime. So it's more than the 15%, you know, it's more than the average, but it's not a guarantee. There's absolutely no mandate that um, that somebody who, you know, if your parent has severe depression, there's actually, you know, better than even chance that you won't, you know, uh, mm -hmm. unless you put a whole bunch of childhood adversary on top of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, then you're, you know, kind of getting slimming down the odds there. But just from genetic inheritance, it increases the odds, but it does not make it a, a mandate. It does not make it a guarantee. Oh, that's cool. Because I know a lot of people think, oh, well, my mom was depressed. I'm just, I'm going to get it. So I'm just going to you know, just like with the, the cancer gene, some breast yes. cancers are passed down. People think it's just something passed down from generation to generation and you're never going to break the cycle. Whereas I like the way you said that it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get depression. Right. Because someone else in your family has it. Now, what did you learn while you're writing this book? 
Oh, so much. So like I said, the physical component was um, so startling to me. That was a, a surprise. I learned uh, one of the big surprises. I always thought of suicide as a, like a stage four of depression. you like, you know, it's like cancer, you know, it progresses. So depression, I thought it progressed towards suicide, but it doesn't. So really surprising to me that suicide has its own inheritance. I mean, it, it's a different inheritance than depression. It has a different neurobiology. It has a different seasonality even. Um, most suicides happen in spring and summer. Most depression is at its worst in the winter. And that's true in Australia also where the seasons are, are flipped. <laughs> so on their spring and summer, which is like, what, February through, no wait, I guess it's the other way around. September, October, November is their spring and summer. Mm -hmm. um, they that's when that's their high suicide season um and and just because it is spring and summer there so that was a big surprise um i was surprised at i guess at the the fact that there is so much active research going on and new treatments coming forward now um, I had thought that the the medications, antidepressant medications, that was, you know, about it. Mm -hmm. But there are, like I said, so many new and different modes of treatment that are coming out now um, that are really effective. And and they're even experimenting with psychedelics, uh, psychedelic drugs now, and it's looking very promising. Um, but so that was another big surprise. I, yeah, I think for me, though, the biggest surprise was how physical it was. I thought of depression as mood. I. I always thought it was mood and it's not, it's very physical in its appearance and it's very physical in what's happening in the brain. Wow. So let's talk about physical appearance of it then. Yeah. So yes. The symptoms? Yes. So, you know, we, these are some of those that we, that we, we talk about. So the sleep disruptions are actually one of the primary symptoms and uh, apparently sleep disruptions, often happen even before somebody's gonna feel depressed. <laughs> so that's one of the first ones. Um, eating, and the, some of the weird things is, so like I said, uh, you know, sometimes people sleep too much or they can't sleep at all. Um, sometimes they eat too much or they can't eat at all. The weirdest thing is sometimes they'll be a week into their major depressive episode and it'll flip. Like they couldn't sleep before, now they're mm. only sleeping. They couldn't eat before, and now they just wanna eat all day. And then, you know, it'll flip again. Um, some of the other, so I kind of take this one personally, but um, people with depression have have uh, trouble uh, thinking, remembering stuff. It's the reason I take it personally is because I I wrote the book because I wanted to help people with depression, and it turns out that people with depression are in absolutely the worst spot um, to actually to read a book that is so <laughs> so dense, so much science in it. You know, like I said, I oh they're just you know. The world is just messing with me here. Um, so they have cognitive difficulties, you know, can't concentrate, can't think, you know, can't remember stuff. So I wrote a book that is pretty much useless for somebody who is actually deeply depressed. So there you go. But actually, it's useful for the ones, though. Yeah, that's what I was about yeah. to say. And for people that are, you know, want to learn more about depression, because yeah. you learn about some of the research behind it, especially if you have a loved one that's struggling with depression, you want to help them, but you don't yes. know how to help them. Right. Yes. I hope it is very useful for those people and for people who have, so depression comes in episodes, you know, a major depressive episode usually lasts several months, but then hopefully somebody, you know, achieves remission, whether it's from the medications or psychotherapy or, or whatever, and they're, they're good, they're fine. Um, so maybe in those good, fine, normal um, stretches, maybe that's when somebody could absorb um, from the book and, and empower, feel empowered, uh, feel hopeful and empowered and be able to, if they do feel themselves going into another major depressive episode, maybe be able to talk uh, very openly with their medical provider and understand what's been recommended and why and bring in their own opinions on that and, you know, be helped in their, um, the course of an illness. What really strikes me about this is as you were talking um, in the book about how many people it affects differently, but also the yeah. treatments are different as well because not the same treatment works for every single solitary person. So yes. let's talk about that. Yes, well, you probably noticed if, you know all those commercials for antidepressants now, if you look them up, a lot of them are kind of the, the same, in a way that they have the same mechanism. In fact, 
basically all traditional antidepressants have are believed to act under the same mechanism. And but there's so many different ones um, with so many different brand names. Um, what what they found is that your your metabolic makeup, so people's metabolism, they're going to affect what your body does when you ingest a drug. Does your body break it down right away? If it does break it down right away, you're going to need to take a lot more. You're going to need a higher mm -hmm. dose before it can even get to your brain to do anything. Um, when it breaks it down, what does it break it down into? Because usually that's a lot of the side effects. A lot of the side effects will come from the, the metabolic, you know, the, pro, uh, the products of the drug, not necessarily the drug itself. So that means that some people will absolutely not talk. There's some, maybe some great drug that's, uh, you know, does, it's wonderful for, you know, about 30% of the people who take it, you know, they get better right away. They feel good and they're, they're good. Other people get ill, they, you know, they start, you know, getting worse, <laughs> it's not effective for them. And a lot of that is what's happening in their body, lot often because of their genetic makeup, um, that either breaks down the drug, breaks it down mm -hmm. to, into unwanted byproducts or what. So yes, that's amazing. People respond very differently to different drugs and um, even to different treatments. And, you know, depression, like I said, it's, it's very individual. Uh, you can say generally that, okay, the right side's hyperactive and the left side's hypoactive of the brain. Um, but what, you know, what exactly are the details of that? Mm -hmm. And different people are different. So our time is almost up. Is there one last little nugget that you want to share with us? I just want to, I guess I would want to encourage people to really ask questions and to feel empowered and feel hopeful that depression is something that it actually can be managed. Um, that with the modern treatments and with really, you know, understanding yourself and how you live and, and maybe what went into your depression, that people can manage depression and come out of it faster, be less likely to go into another major depressive episode. They can live a really a much better life if they actually just learn more about themselves, about what the what the illness is, and and ask the right questions about their from their medical providers. And Sarah, where can people find you at? Okay, I have a website www.sarahzabel.com, and I think you know because. Not easy to spell, but see that Sarah's, I can't get that right. There you go. Sarah Zobel, spelled like that, dot com. <laughs> and they can find me there. And your book again? Fighting Chance. Yes, Sarah, I want to thank you so much for coming on and talking about depression. And I, like I said, guys, this is a very dense book. She says it's the cheesecake of, even yes. though I could eat a, a cheesecake in the whole sitting because she, cheesecake is like my favorite food. <laughs> of um, course. But, but Definitely, if you have someone that's struggling with depression, get it and read it in little itsy bitsy pieces and know, especially with the stories that you share about other people and how they dealt with their depression and, and family members of how they dealt. So you can kind of learn and realize you're not alone. Because a lot of people, I think depression is like, I'm so alone. Nobody knows what I'm going through. And yes. in this book, you'll see you're not alone. Right? Yes. Okay, guys. So, Sarah, I want to thank you once again for coming on and sharing about your book. And I can't wait to see what you're up to next. What are you up to next, anyways? Besides, I am working on another book. It's still early in the in the you know exploring it, making sure I can get the right references and interviews and everything. And I believe I can. So it's going to be on let's say mental health neuroscience. Oh, going along with depression. So there we go. So yes. <laughs> so. Thank you, Sarah, for coming on and for sharing. Thank you, Melissa, for having me. And guys, we will see you on the next chat from the blog cabin. Bye. Bye-bye.